And welcome to Advantage Radio Ministries and welcome to Second Chances here at Lift FM. My name is Greg Hennis. This is our weekly program, Tuesday nights at 9 o'clock here at Lift FM 98.5 here in the uh, South Jersey area. And of course, we have uh, additional uh, broadcast at 103.3 FM in the Millville Vineland area. 97.9 97.9 for our friends down in the Cape May County region, Rio Grande, Cape May County, uh, there in uh, Cape May and Wildwood, and of course our friends in Salem County at 88.1. This is our weekly program where we are privileged and honored each and every week to bring on people from all walks of life. And the interesting thing about our, our program here on Tuesday nights on Lift FM is that we have people that are in the ministry people that have never been in the ministry and some people that are in the ministry and have no idea that they're in the ministry but (laughs) but here's the bottom line is they all have something in common that is that they love jesus and they've allowed uh, the lord to be the guider of their lives and today we are very privileged and honored to have with us the new pastor of millville's first assembly of god church at 1700 wheaton avenue his name is uh, pastor john dingle And, uh, Pastor, first of all, thank you for coming uh, on with us here at uh, Second Chances. Greg, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Now, today is the first day, actually, that uh, either one of us have met. And uh, when I was looking at your resume, I saw that uh, prior to coming to Millville, you were in Virginia. I kind of thought you were a guy from the South, and I get talking to you, and I find out you're from? Jackson, New Jersey. And if you say to yourself, well, that sounds awful familiar, what... What is Jackson, New Jersey known for? Jackson, New Jersey is the home of Six Flags Great Adventure. So if you've been to Great Adventure before, you've been to where Pastor Dingle's from. (laughs) That's right. All right, Pastor. Well, first of all, uh, you are new to this area. Correct. Uh, Tell us, give us a little bit of background about uh, what kind of a family you came from, where you were born, things of that nature. Well, I was born in uh, Wisconsin in a little place called Waukesha. It's a few minutes outside of Milwaukee, and uh, my father was a mechanic, um, and he was employed by the Kmart Corporation, and so every time he would get promoted, we would move. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, and so he was the mechanic, then he was the manager of the auto department, then he was the manager of the store, and so we moved from Wisconsin to Virginia to upstate New York, to Easton, Pennsylvania, and then finally over to Jackson, and I was there when I was nine years old. Wow. So it almost sounds like at a very young age, the Lord was preparing you for ministry because of (laughs) moving around. Exactly. And uh, and my mother, uh, they both, my mother and father were both born in the Carlisle, Pennsylvania area, so blue-collar kind of family. And uh, as my dad would get promoted, my mom was more of a stay-at-home mom, until we moved to New Jersey, but uh, it was in Easton, Pennsylvania, where my mother gave her heart to Jesus Christ, and that's where my journey of faith began as well. Uh, Any immediate members of your family, aunts, uncles, you know, things of that nature in the ministry besides yourself? No, I'm I'm not a first-generation Christian, but I'm the one of the only ministers in my family that, that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, was your family uh, Assemblies of God, or were they uh, a similar uh, denomination? My father, when he was young, attended a Brethren church in uh, Central PA and sang in the choir there, and then got disillusioned a little bit in his faith until in his late 70s, or his early 70s, he came back to the Lord. Um, but Assemblies of God didn't uh, happen in our family until my mother gave her heart to the Lord in, in Easton when I was about in first grade. How about that? So how does one go from being the, the father, or a, I'm sorry, a son of a mechanic, how does one uh, kind of make their way uh, from, from where you are and all these different places into the calling that the Lord has on your life? How did, how did that happen? Well, I want to say that uh, I started off really more interested in music and in sports. You know, probably like most young men, I was uh, really enthralled with baseball. I was an Eagles fan, a Phillies fan. Oh. Yeah, so it's good I was finally. Af- I was afraid Jackson, New Jersey, I was afraid it was going to be the, the guys in New York. Yeah, right, right. And then there's a lot of that. But because my father is from central uh, Pennsylvania, he's a Philadelphia fan, was an avid Phillies Eagles fan, and so that rubbed off on onto me. And so I had that dream of wanting to be an athlete, and uh, – through some different circumstances in middle school and in high school, I was more drawn into music. From music, I went into college to be a high school band director. That was my plan. 
and I studied music at Westchester University. I was there, and in my senior year, the Lord got a hold of my life in a dramatic way. And all of what I had learned in the Assembly of God churches growing up as a young person, as a teenager, finally, all those seeds really just came to life inside of my heart, and I felt God's call into the ministry. So you, you, you made that uh, decision uh, as the Lord tugged on you to get into the ministry. How does, how does one actually, once they say, this is what the Lord has in store for me, how does one actually get down that road? Wow. I think what it was was I knew that where I had been before God got a hold of my life was I had separated myself from the body of Christ. I wasn't going to church. I wasn't attending uh, church like I had when I was younger. So first step for me was I need to get back into church. And when I did, I started to meet with some of the leaders there. I started to talk about the things that God was doing inside of me, and I received some mentoring from the pastors at the church uh, in the town where I went to college, as well as um, the area where I grew up when I would go home. And through those different relationships, they guided me into um, the right path for me because I did finish my degree. I do have a bachelor's in music education. And instead of going to get another bachelor's degree in ministry, they steered me down a path that uh, made it possible for me to get my credentials um, and, to, and to still become uh, a full-time minister without having to reinvest another four years of uh, academic uh, expenses. Now, you are a, a younger guy, if you don't mind me saying that. Oh, uh, thank you. Younger, obviously, you're younger than me. I'm 49, so you're 44. 45, 44. Oh, 40, okay, okay. Uh, you have wife, two kids? Yes, sir. Uh, my wife, Lisa, um, we met in college, and when God got a hold of my life, the, one of the first steps was going to a campus ministry, and God um, put me right in face-to-face -face with my wife there at that campus ministry called Christians in Action. And... Uh, we met, it was 1994 back then, and uh, we have, uh, we've been married since May of 2001, and Allie, our daughter, was born March 2004, and Ryan, uh, December 2007, so they're 13 and 9, and they are both unique and beautiful in their own way. We love them. Uh, wife, does she come from any kind of a background in ministry? Um, not directly in ministry, but uh, a strong Christian family. I think there's several generations of Christians, and she grew up primarily Methodist, and then they went to a more uh, charismatic uh, church when she was approaching her teen years, and, uh, and that's what set us up for when she got on uh, campus at Westchester University. That's where we met, because it was a more lively, charismatic kind of a group. So. Mm -hmm. So she was okay with uh, what what be, being a pastor's wife entails, and I was looking at your resume, Florida, Virginia, and uh, <laughs> Freehold. She was okay with all that? She was, <laughs> and, you know, now that everybody knows a little bit about my story, and you know, moving for me was part of the norm. Moving for her was not. She's from southern Delaware. Her dad uh, was a chicken farmer, and... Her family, both sides of her family, several generations were all from Southern Delaware, so moving was not something that was she was used to. Mo going to college was a big move for her. So these moves, God has given her a lot of grace, you know, to be a pastor's wife and to move from New Jersey to Florida to Virginia and now back to New Jersey. And, and since you're, you know, originally kind of sort of from this area— uh, you, you touched on the Phillies, Flyers, Sixers, and Eagles, mm. big sports guy. We, we call that here four for four. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just a little lingo. You might, That's good. You'll impress some of the local people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so, Pastor, um, so, you know, it looks like early on in your, your ministry, you were geared toward music, then you became a, a youth pastor. Correct. Uh, one thing that I, you know, this is just my, my thing, um, I, I, I see today, I see... You know, a lot of uh, kids that are in the church, they get out of church as far as you know, they, they, they go to college, right. and they kind of leave the church, and they don't return. So youth groups such as this are really strong, aren't they, uh, youth groups? And, and talk, to the, talk to the people right now about why that is so important, youth ministries and things about keeping the kids dialed in. I think that what parents need to know is that youth ministries in churches exist to help the parents um, 
could we come alongside parents to help them raise their children in a way that would honor God? And there's so many voices out there. There are so many temptations that even it seems more and more as uh, things become more and more open to our, our students through um, social media, through technology, that the youth ministry's job is becoming more and more important to help these students navigate. Because I tell parents many times, and when a student reaches these teenage years, there comes this point where it seems like the communication stops. And, and so the students stop talking to parents, parents stop talking to students. And some of that is um, just the way the students are maturing and looking to their friends and looking to other voices, you know, to confirm what they've learned. And I tell parents is that it's, it's like when uh, NASA had the space shuttle program, the space shuttle or the, uh, the, uh, the astronauts, when they would come back from uh, orbit, there would be this time of re-entry where NASA could not communicate with the astronauts. And so I would tell parents, hey, look, they're in re-entry right now. And it may seem lonely, it may seem, but we're here. We're here with them. They're talking to us. You know, and we're trying to reinforce the values that you want at home. And that way, when we can give them a good launch from senior high into college, one of the goals of any youth ministry should be to help families connect if the students are going to college to say, okay, you need to plug into a ministry at college. Because too many times we say, thanks for being in our youth group for the last six years or seven years or five years, and now... You know, God bless you, and we wave goodbye, but we don't set them up for success beyond youth group. And I've seen many students, they get almost addicted to youth group, and they get to college and there's nothing there for them, or they don't know that there's anything there for them. So parents, I would say if if your students are going to a youth ministry, talk to the youth pastor about if they're seniors, if they're getting ready to move on with their life into young adulthood, help uh, communicate with the youth pastor to help them connect with either the local church if they're staying close in community college or if they're just going to be working right away or if they're going away to college. You know, there are people that they can talk to to help make that connection either on the campus with ministries like uh, Campus Crusade or Chi Alpha. There's many places where students can plug in, and that's vital for their spiritual growth. And I believe that there is a Chi Alpha uh, chapter here at Rowan, uh, and, 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 and I believe. If I'm not mistaken, I, I've done a lot of these interviews, but I believe uh, just a few months ago I had one of those gentlemen on. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a great organization. I was very impressed when I heard about that. Chi Alpha is a wonderful organization. I know there's one at Rutgers and all around the country. You know, it's uh, it's worth investigating because Chi Alpha can be just a a huge blessing to any student who's uh, coming to a new place. Okay. So let's kind of let's kind of fast forward here just a little bit. So... Uh, you have been at Millville's First Assembly of God since? June 5th. Okay, so you're very new here. I am fresh. I am green. Yeah. I am first time being a lead pastor and brand new in South Jersey, so to speak. So Now, October 1st, and by the way, this interview will have already aired by then, but October 1st is, is what happened for you. Oh, uh, October 1st was when we were um, officially commissioned by the Assemblies of God New Jersey District. Um, our New Jersey District Superintendent, Carl, Letty, Carl Coletti, came down and conducted a service where we were officially uh, commissioned to be the pastors, even though we had already been there for a few months. He came down and commissioned us officially to uh, to be the lead of the church there. Now, if if you had already, I'm just just for the purpose of understanding. Right. If you had been a pastor somewhere else, would you still get commissioned? Yes. Anytime you go to a new church. Right. And it's it's one of the ways that the district can communicate with the church and say. You know, we know that you have elected, you know, this uh, this pastor to be your pastor, but we also give our seal of approval, and we stand with you. And so the church stands with the pastor, the district stands with the pastor, and it, it, feels, it feels good when you're a pastor and you have all that support. So prior to coming here, you were in Fairfax, Virginia. Is that correct? <laughs> that's right. Okay, and, I, and if I'm not mistaken, that's not too far. Is that... Uh, isn't that kind of near the uh, Chesapeake Bay Bridge in that vicinity once you cross over, or am I wrong? It's, uh, well, if, if, uh, if you look at D.C. as a, as a clock, um, Fairfax is roughly around 9 o'clock, 
on the on the beltway there and uh, the chesapeake uh, bay bridge would be a little bit east of three o'clock so we're it'd be through dc and then but it's not too far away i could be to the chesapeake bay bridge in probably an hour or less depending on traffic and how fast you know I was driving at now, the time. Now, since I'm from this area, the, the other question that I would ask, and why not, is there Wawa's in Fairfax? Um, I know they're close uh, by. Wow. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful question. I worked at Wawa when I was in Jackson. No kidding. So I love Wawa. And in Fairfax, there are no Wawa's. Oh, the, no. The closest Wawa's are on in Virginia on the 95 corridor. So I would have to drive all the way to, say, Woodbridge or uh, Stafford or somewhere in between there, which was at least a half an hour, 45 minutes from where I live. So unfortunately, I would get to Wawa occasionally, but it is so nice to be back in Wawa country. <laughs> There's plenty of them here, <laughs> yeah. almost every corner, even with the gas station. It's so true. <laughs> All right. So how did you find Mill? How did, how did you end up in Millville? I mean, I mean, Fairfax, Virginia to Millville doesn't seem, you know, I know they're probably actually both probably below the Mason Dixon line, but still, how did you end up here? <laughs> um, we, when I say we, my wife and I, were beginning to sense God calling us to change roles. We had been youth pastors and worship leading um, for, you know, several years, since 2001, so almost our whole married life. And so for 16 years, serving in that capacity was wonderful, and we, we enjoyed it. But we sensed God changing our role, and so when that happened, one of the places that we felt like we would want to come back to was New Jersey. And so we submitted our paperwork to the district office in New Jersey with the Assemblies of God, and then we just waited. We prayed, we waited, and we just trusted the Lord. And what the New Jersey district does is they know which churches are needing pastors, and they make the connection. And so I got a call from one of the uh, members of the search committee, and uh, we began to talk. And as we were beginning to talk, I was beginning to sense more and more like this is a very strong possibility and began to share it with my wife. And my wife, who, you know, isn't excited about moving but is willing to, was like, took a deep breath and said, okay. Closer to Delaware. <laughs> yes, closer to Delaware and closer to Wawa. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, we, uh, <laughs> so we prayed. And there was a moment, I can say, tell you this for sure. Um, I was dropping my son off at gymnastics and driving back to my house because my wife was going to pick him up when his time was done. I was listening to a song in the car by a worship group called House Fires, and the song is called Build My Life. And it was a new song to me at the time. It was earlier this year, and as I was driving, the chorus of the song uh, has the word lead in it. Um, Fill my heart and lead me in your love is the line. And when it got to that word lead, I felt a strong just presence of God in around me in that car. And I began to really just almost instantly weep and cry and not even sure exactly why at first. But then I began to just have this sense that, that God was saying now, you know, this is the moment when I'm letting you know that you are going to be moving. This is the moment where you will... Um, I'm opening the door now for this move to happen. And it wasn't confirmed completely yet that Millville was the place, but I had a strong, strong sense that it was. And Tell, tell us a little bit about the, what kind of happens uh, once that connection is made. There's some dialogue, and, and you know, explain. This is fascinating. It's an interesting process, really. And uh, when, when we dialogue back and forth, uh, I'm talking with uh, a search committee. So a church puts together a committee made up of you know various board members and lay leaders in the church and their job is to kind of go through these resumes and pray and decide what kind of person they think would be a good fit for their congregation and then to contact them and invite them to come and begin to interview with them first and so that was the first step was in our conversations we were beginning to get a sense that okay we we uh we like what we're hearing from the church and the church seems to like what we're saying to them and so they invited us um to be their uh candidate or their nominee you might say so of all the resumes they'll pick one and so we were the one that they chose and then once that choices made they invited us to come and meet the members at a breakfast 
and to share a little bit about our lives, a little bit about our heart. Um, our resume was handed out and some recommendation letters were handed out. Search committee thought that would be good for the members. And so we just, we just introduced ourselves. And then we were invited back again to meet with more of the church people, um, even the people who aren't members but attend the church. It was open to everybody. And so we met with them. And then we spoke on a Sunday um, where we ran the service, we did the worship, preached the message, and then, and this is sort of the, the moment of truth, you might say, the scary part, is after that service, you know, you are back in an office, and meanwhile, the church is having a meeting, and they're deciding at that moment if you are going to be their pastor. And so we're, we just finished the service, we preached, and now we're in the office knowing that the congregation is voting right now, yes or no. Wow. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's a, it's, and it was interesting is in the paperwork, it told us, you know, that if the vote is favorable, invite the pastor and his family back in and welcome and, and let them speak a little bit. And then it says, but if the vote is not favorable, just kindly escort them out the back door. <laughs> Wow. And I guess that's just, you know, to avoid any uncomfortable feelings, but it was, it's sort of this high pressure moment. Wow. And, uh, and but uh, I think we felt, you know, so confident that God was leading us here that we didn't really feel that pressure like we should have. We are visiting with Pastor John Dingle, the new head pastor at Millville's First Assembly of God Church. Uh here on Lift FM, Pastor Dingle, if, if someone would like to learn more about, we're going to continue the interview here in a second, would like to learn more about uh, First Assembly of God in Millville, learn about uh, the ministries, get in contact. Is there some easy ways to do that? The easiest way would probably be to check out our website, and that is millvillechurch.com. It's simple, millvillechurch.com. Okay. Uh, service times. Service times right now, Sunday mornings. Um, we get together, there is a, a Bible study that meets at 9.30. It's sort of a, a Sunday school time for the adults. We're growing into having some Sunday school hours for children. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Um, and then after 9.30, there's a brief time where there's some refreshments and folks can uh, talk with one another. And 10.45, 10.45 a.m. is when our first morning service begins. And Sunday evening service? Uh, Sunday Wednesday evening nights? service, uh, we have youth on, on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. Um, and then Wednesday evening, 7 p.m., there's something for the whole family. We have uh, adult uh, classes. We have Royal Rangers and Girls Ministry for the boys and girls um, from pre-K all the way up to 12th grade. And uh, obviously, I know there was, uh, I don't know how many years ago it was, but there was a fire there. So the, the, the right. sanctuary is fairly refurbished. and It's and completely refurbished. The, the lobby looks beautiful. I know my predecessor, Pastor Joe, did a wonderful job navigating this church through some very difficult times, and uh, and uh, I'm very thankful for his leadership and you know spearheading that whole renovation project, and uh, I'm very thankful for him. I know there was even a boiler situation. I, I was reading. <laughs> I was reading uh, one of the uh, one of the things uh, about you, and I saw that there was a, a wonderful praise report about that. That's correct. The uh, one of the boilers last year. Um, I think it, it just gave out or it exploded. I don't know what it was. It wasn't a massive explosion, but if it was, but um, uh, it ended up that uh, God took care of that and provided thousands and thousands of dollars for that to be replaced as well in, in just, you know, unexpected ways. And so we're just, we're so grateful that even though things were difficult for the church last year, that God used, you know, our predecessor, he used the prayers of the people, the the wisdom of the board, uh, to navigate through those waters, and now those blessings are starting to really surface and come to fruition. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, last question before I bring up the final topic. is it Does it ever happen that a predecessor and the current pastor get to meet? Does that ever happen? Sure, sure. And Did uh, that happen for you? It did, and it's interesting because Pastor Joe Green and I were friends before um, he was even the pastor of Millville. 
Um, those of you who are from, you know, the Millville area and you know some of the history, Pastor Kenyon has been in this community for 60 years and is just a, a rock, a bedrock in this community. Everybody and, knows Pastor Kenyon. Yeah, and uh, I've become, you know, good friends with him as well. He's, he's been super supportive, and uh, I'm thankful for his friendship and support too. But Pastor Joe was a missionary in Paraguay when I was a youth pastor in Freehold, New Jersey, and I took my youth group and some other youth groups on two trips down to Paraguay. And so I had formed a relationship with him uh, real quick. The uh, interesting thing, 10 years ago, I served with Joe. The Lord spoke to my heart and said, I want you um, to go and serve with Joe Green for about two months. And so I ended up going for six weeks. And while I was there, I was fully expecting, is God going to call me to be a missionary? I'm in Paraguay. I have a two-year-old daughter at home. I have a wife. God, why are you having me here? The church that I was with allowed me to go, and somebody paid for my expenses. So it was clear that God was opening this opportunity. But as a result, nothing really stuck out. I, I served. It was great. I met, you know, got to know Joe better. But 10 years later, I'm talking with one of the board members, you know, about during this search committee process of being the pastor. And I said, oh, I know your former pastor. I know Joe Green. I, and he said, you know Pastor Joe? I said, yes. And so he told me that he immediately called Pastor Joe, and Pastor Joe became a reference for me. Wow. And so that was, you know, so I just know... God, 10 years ago, was seeing this whole thing line up and allowed me to serve with Joe so that 10 years later he could be a good reference for me. And so that was wonderful. That's awesome. Uh, final thing we want to talk about, Pastor, big events, a lot of growth at the church, a lot of uh, Lord's uh, hand in operation, but there's been an event there that has happened for, I believe, many years. Am I correct about this trunk or treat? I think so. Remember, I'm still three months old and I'm learning some things, but I think this is not the first time they've done it. Tell me about it. When is it? What's it entail? Can anybody come? Is it free? All that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Trunk or Treat is a Halloween alternative. It is a fall festival. It is a celebration time. It's going to happen October 28th. That's a Saturday, um, the Saturday before Halloween from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. It's for children of all ages, and what it is is individuals from our church, or even if in the, you're in the community and you want to participate, you can have your automobile decorated in some fall festive way. And what people do is they'll typically open up their trunk, and there'll be some kind of small game for kids to play in the trunk, and then they'll receive candy you know, for playing the game. And they can go from car to car. But we're also planning on having food there, free. Everything is free to the public, and you don't have to be even part of the church to come. It is for the whole community. We just want to bless you know, the people and the families of Millville. So it's October 28th, Saturday, October 28th, starting at what time? 1 p.m. 1 p.m. until? 4 p.m. And that's at 1700 Wheaton Avenue? Correct. Okay. So, Pastor Dingle, it, it has absolutely been a, been a pleasure to have you on today. One of the things we love to do is we love to give people at the very end of our program an opportunity to pray for people. But if you're listening to this program today, and maybe you have not been in church in a while, or you're looking for a church home, we can suggest uh, Millville's First Assembly of God to you. Uh, Pastor Dingle, there may be somebody listening to this program today that is lost their way with the Lord, maybe is in a desperate place, yeah. is looking for the Lord to touch them, and we love to end this program with an opportunity for salvation. So, Pastor, would you please lead us in a word of prayer? I'd be glad to. You know, God offers us hope, and so as we pray, just know that there's hope for you. And so if you want to receive Jesus, and uh, just repeat this prayer in your heart, we would say something like, Jesus, I thank you for saving me. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And Lord, I pray that you would take you know, the pieces of my life, whatever they are right now, and that you would put them together in such a way that you would make something beautiful with my life. I give you permission to take control, and I thank you for being my Lord and Savior. And we pray it all in your name. Amen. Once again, our guest today on Second Chances has been Pastor John Dingle, the uh, pastor of Millville's First Assembly of God Church, 1700 Wheaton Avenue in Millville. Service time Sunday, 1045. That's correct, 1045. And uh, website, one more time? It is millvillechurch.com. Well, thank you so much, Pastor. And thank it's you, a Greg. Pleasure, pleasure to meet you, and uh, we, we, we wish you nothing but the best here in Millville. Thank you.